Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's July 2020, and you're listening to Episode 194, which is a discussion about using personal biography as apologetics. On this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Douglas Groteis, who is a professor of philosophy at Denver Seminary, a longtime contributor to the Christian Research Journal, and the author of the book, Walking Through Twilight, A Wife's Illness, A Philosopher's Lament. Doug has written an online exclusive feature article for the Christian Research Journal, and his article is called Autobiography as Apologetic, and you can read it for free at our website, equip.org. Doug, it's good to have you on. Thank you. Happy to be on another podcast with you. Well, this is kind of a different article than you've written for us in the past. Doug has been writing for us for a couple of decades now. And this article, as I mentioned, is about autobiography as an apologetic. And I find that to be a very interesting subject because a lot of times autobiographies, people use autobiographies to tell stories about why something may not be true, including religion. So there's a lot of stories, mainly in the media recently, of people who have become famous and well-known pastors or other, you know, Christian leaders or Christian musicians, and they have come to this epiphany that Christianity is not true. And here's their apologetic through their story about why it's not true. So how can autobiography be used in a positive way to reinforce the truth of Christianity. I think if it's done in the right way, your story is a story of the truth of the gospel. So in writing this article, I didn't simply want to tell people about myself. I wanted to say something about my intellectual journey. So I'm a philosopher and I've been thinking about Christian truth claims now for over 40 years, and I've written extensively about it. I've taught it, preached it, done debates, so many things. So now that I'm 63, I thought that in light, especially of all these deconversions, that I wanted to say something about my story. And although I can't live up to this example, obviously, I think my inspiration was uh, St. Augustine in his great book, The Confessions, where Later on in his life, he reflects back on his life before converting as a man in his 30s, and then his walk with the Lord since. And along the way, he explores all manner of issues about God and time and the nature of the soul and so on. So I thought in a short article that I would say something about how I became a Christian and how I grew as a Christian and why I remain a Christian. So part of this, I think, was really sparked by all these deconversion stories and also by the fact that I'm getting older, not that old, still still kicking, but 63 years old. And uh, sadly, a lot of great Christian leaders and writers have died recently, like Ravi Zacharias and Nabil Qureshi and R.C. Sproul and Norman Geisler and so on. So I wanted to, I guess, go on record with something about my pilgrimage and testimony. Well, you bring up Augustine, and a lot of Christians aren't that familiar with church history, as they should be probably, and they don't realize that his conversion was one that was more dramatic. Maybe you can just give our listeners a couple of highlights about who he was, because Mm -hmm. I would say the average Christian probably doesn't spend as much time in church history as they probably should. Right. Well, St. Augustine was really the first great theologian of the Middle Ages. He wrote the Confessions. He also wrote The City of God, a major work on the relationship of the kingdom of God to the kingdoms of this world. And he died in 430 AD. His life was one of intellectual pursuit. He was an expert in rhetoric and he taught that subject. He lived in Northern Africa. And he was a follower of a philosophy that was dualistic. It was called Manichaeanism. And it taught that the soul was good, but the body was evil. And 
Augustine followed this for some time, although he himself was quite a sensualist and even uh, had a child out of wedlock. But he converted largely through apologetics. He heard good arguments for Christianity given by Ambrose. And then he also had a very significant experience where he was really wrestling with his flesh, with his sinful desires to be sensual and to not obey God. And he heard a child sing a little song that said, take up and read, take up and read. So he went to the Bible and he opened it just randomly. And he came across the passage, which says, make no provision for the flesh, but follow Christ. So uh, this conjunction of events, his own disappointment with his Manichaean worldview and the teachings of Ambrose for Christianity, and then this experience in light of his own long-term struggle helped lead him to come to Christ. And I talk about that actually in my book, Philosophy in Seven Sentences. I have a chapter on Augustine. Well, I hope that short little summary of who he was and his life and his conversion is an encouragement to our listeners, because sometimes I think people think, well, I used to be someone who was so far from God and maybe somebody who had a background like Augustine, who was, you know, he was quite sexually active outside of Mm -hmm. marriage. And yet, at the same time, God redeemed that, redeemed him, and he is a very noted person in church history. So right. um, I'm sure people are encouraged to hear that. I think sometimes we forget, we think that people who have gone before us in church history haven't faced the same struggles that we do in modern times, but yet so many of those Christians, great Christians in that the Lord has used in Christian uh, church history have had big struggles that personally that uh, the Lord redeemed them from. Well, I want to come back to you specifically because this is an autobiography of your life as an apologetic. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your religious background? Right. I was uh, not raised in an observant Christian family, although my parents would say they were Christians. I was taken to be baptized in a Presbyterian church when I was a baby. But uh, our family didn't attend religious services very often. My mother was raised Catholic. My father was raised Protestant. So we occasionally went to the Presbyterian Church. I attended Sunday school, but not for very long. And I went by myself. My parents didn't attend church with me. But I would put them in the category of God-fearing people. This is the 1950s and 60s. They had a Christian basis for morality And uh, at least with my mother, I believe that when she passed away 10 years ago, she was a Christian. So I was not raised an atheist or an agnostic. I was taught to pray. Bad things were not said about the church, but the church was not an integral part of my life growing up. So from that kind of very, very nominal Christian background... And I want to ask you, so if your parents didn't go to church, how did you go to church? Well, they they sent me to Sunday school for a while, and it was only three blocks from our house. So this is in Anchorage, Alaska in the early 1960s. So I could walk there and back, put on my, my good shoes and my good clothes and so on. And I have some memories of that, not too many. But as I got older, my father died when I was young, when I was 11, in a plane crash. But I don't know that I had any Christian friends growing up. Maybe I did, but if I did, they didn't talk about it. And when I got into high school, I got interested in Eastern religions, uh, mostly through music. Uh, People like Carlos Santana and John McLaughlin had an interest in Eastern religions, and both of these folks followed a guru named uh, Sri Chinmoy. So I began to read these interviews with them, and read material in their albums that would quote this guru and so on. And I started reading uh, Aldo Huxley. And uh, this was in the early to mid 70s. So that was still basically the outer rim of the counterculture, which came to Alaska about five years late, given that we're somewhat removed from the rest of the culture, especially then. So I became interested in 
Eastern spirituality at that time, although I did not join any group, I did not attend any uh, religious service of Buddhism or Hinduism or anything like that. But I was exposed to the gospel several times. Uh, there's a, a writer and a speaker, some of your listeners may know, named Bob Larson, pretty controversial. But in the early to mid-70s, he was well known for giving talks about the evils of rock and roll. And my friends and I were very much interested in enthusiasts of rock and roll. So we attended two of his lectures or crusades basically to just laugh at him. And we realized that he got some of his facts wrong about the rock musicians he was talking about. But both times I uh, really started to wonder if Christianity might be true. And after one of these talks, a woman came up to me and said, uh, do you think you're a sinner? And I said, no. And then she said, if you died tonight, do you know where you would go? And I said, no. And I, that started to worry me. But a year later, I had become a Christian. And I could answer those questions. Yes, I am a sinner. And yes, I do know where I would go. I would go to be with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But uh, a lot of things happened between uh, that short interaction with the woman at church and, and my conversion. So two things. First of all, I know you didn't go to any kind of services for Eastern religions, but did you attempt to try to practice any Eastern practices based on mm -hmm. just some of the band that you were following. And right. then why don't you tell us a little bit more specifically, what was your journey to become a Christian from that time at the Bar Bob Larson crusade to mm -hmm. becoming a Christian a year later? Right. Well, I went to college in the fall of 1975. I went to the University of Northern Colorado in Greeley. And that was a really lonely time for me, but I learned something of the discipline of study, reading, getting more academically involved. I took a course on the wisdom of Indian China. I read books about out-of-the-body experiences and so on. And I was really moving in that direction. And I also got involved with studying philosophy and was quite impressed with atheist philosophers like Karl Marx and Friedrich Nietzsche and Sigmund Freud. So my mind was kind of a cauldron of desiring some kind of mystical experience, but at the same time being drawn to atheism. But a number of things happened that put me on the right path by the grace of God. And the Lord spoke to me through my reading and also through various experiences. I had been reading a bit about the Christian philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, and I was trying to be an atheist, and I thought, well, Kierkegaard was a Christian, so he has to be wrong. So I think I wrote a pretty dismissive paper about him. But one night I had a very bizarre dream that there was this gigantic head outside my dorm window. And I was on, I think, like the third or fourth floor of my dorm. And when I woke up, I felt like I was in complete darkness and on the wrong side of God. It was a deeply unnerving feeling. So I opened one of the Kierkegaard books called The Sickness Unto Death and began to read. And what Kierkegaard was explaining was my own condition. It was that of someone who pits himself against God and doesn't want to be redeemed, doesn't want to be saved, wants to define himself by virtue of opposing God. And by reading especially philosophers like Nietzsche, that was my viewpoint, because I would go outside and look at the beautiful clouds and the sky and the mountains and so on and think, darn it, you know, it's awfully hard to be an atheist. So Kierkegaard helped explain my own condition to me. And that really haunted me. And another event was that I would hitchhike from Greeley to Boulder whenever I could, because Boulder was much more exciting for a young pagan than Greeley, Colorado. I had a friend in Boulder and upon arriving on one of my trips, he introduced me to two young women who were in the Navigators ministry, a campus ministry. We talked with them and they presented the gospel to me. And I argued with them, but again, I felt haunted. I felt like they might be onto something. 
But I did not convert in Greeley, Colorado. When I went home to Anchorage the summer of 1976, about half of my friends had become Christians and half had not. And so I talked quite a bit with those who had become Christians. And some pretty remarkable things happened at that time. I met with one of my friends uh, named Dan Lowe, who is uh, an excellent musician, good man, Dan and his wife, Peggy. And I had written a card, actually typed a card to Dan, and he showed it to me. And he said, look at this sentence. You typed 666 through the word friend. And I said, what? And I had. And he said, you know what that means? And I said, no, I don't. And then he showed me that passage in Revelation about the mark of the beast. Now, I still don't really know how that 666 got there. It wasn't a joke. It wasn't a jab. I might have wanted to underline the word, and instead I pressed 666 because I didn't depress the shift key. I don't really know. But again, I had that feeling that I was on the wrong side of God. In fact, I might even be opposing God. So I started to read the scriptures, talk to my Christian friends, and I had another dream that was significant. I was a big follower of a musician named Todd Rundgren, and at that time in the mid-70s, he was very much into Eastern mysticism. It came through his lyrics. He would sing about karma, reincarnation, the new age dawning, and so on. And he had a music video called I Was Born to Synthesize. He was sitting in the lotus position. And I had seen that, I think maybe only once on television. This is before you could see anything, anytime on YouTube. But I had this dream that he was sitting in this lotus position and singing, I was born to hypnotize. And I realized that he was hypnotizing me, that the story of Jesus was in fact true. Now, at that point, I didn't have a lot of apologetic evidence at my disposal. It was more that I was seeing that Christ made an absolute claim on my life, that is, follow me, and that I was facing a fork in the road. Uh, There's another experience I had where I was talking to a friend of mine while we were driving, and my friend Steve said, you should meet this fellow I know who is very spiritual. He's into yoga, and he could probably help you with your quest. And as soon as Steve had said that, He saw this man, and uh, we both pulled over and got out of the car, and the man looked right at me and said, uh, Steve said, what a coincidence, we were just talking about you. And the man looked directly at me and said it was no coincidence. And then we talked about getting together. We exchanged phone numbers. Now, we never met again because the sovereign grace of God intervened, and shortly after that, I became a Christian. I confess Christ publicly in a meeting of Christians. I think this was probably early June of 1976. And a short time later after that, I was uh, baptized. You're listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest is Dr. Douglas Groteis, who has written an online exclusive feature article for the Christian Research Journal, and his article is called Autobiography as Apologetic, and you can read it for free at our website, equip.org. Now, normally you hear me say subscribe to the Christian Research Journal for 3350 at our website, equip.org, and you can still do that. But most importantly, I want to make sure you don't miss this. We really need you to help us out, and there's no financial cost to you. It's just a few moments of your time. Please rate and review our podcast wherever you get your podcasts, or specifically at Apple Podcasts, you can search for Postmodern Realities, and you can give us a starred review, which literally will take you seconds, or just a minute or so. Just think of one or two sentences about what you appreciate about this podcast, and give us a written review. We don't have very many reviews but there are thousands of people that download this podcast every month. So we'd like to beef that up because it helps other people find our content and helps our podcast to grow. And that's one way that's essential that you can partner with us. Another way, if a subscription is not in your budget this month, is to give us a tip and you can tip us 
for what would have been the cost of a coffee or a film out, like three, five, or ten dollars. Maybe more of you are staying in, so you have some change maybe that you can give us a tip. You can do that at our website. You just go to the main landing page at equip.org, you find magazine, and if you click on that drop down menu, just click to Postmodern Realities Podcast. You'll see all episodes all the way back to the beginning of 2016, episode one. And you can catch up on past episodes you might have missed, but more specifically, hit the landing page of any of our episodes and you can find a link where you can give us a tip. And we thank you for all the ways in which you partner with us and help us develop our content and make it available to more people because all of this content that you hear on the podcast is completely free. And thank you. We were just talking about how you came to Christ just through a series of providential events in your Mm -hmm. life as you were looking into things. And um, obviously the Holy Spirit was at work moving where you didn't end up going down the path of Eastern mysticism that you were kind of looking into. So after you became a Christian, what was your early Christian life like? Well, it changed. I realized that following Christ meant something. It meant everything. And it meant denying certain things. But I didn't have a real positive, happy experience when I became a Christian. I believe Christ was the way and I needed to follow him. But unlike many of my friends, I didn't have a great feeling of forgiveness or joy And that bothered me, really, for for many months. And I wondered, well, did it really take? Am I really born again? And I didn't really gain a lot of confidence as a Christian until that next fall when I went to Eugene, Oregon, and started attending a very biblically oriented church with excellent preaching and teaching, began to study the Bible, and also began to discover apologetics, specifically through the writings of Francis Schaeffer. So as I look back, I realize that it matters, I think, that I didn't have a profound conversion experience because I've never really based my belief in Christianity on my own subjective experience, but rather on the objective evidence for it. Now, I've walked with God for over 40 years now, and I've seen his hand, and I've felt his goodness and presence even through the worst of things. But When I've had feelings of desolation and even feelings of abandonment, particularly through my first wife's illness with dementia, I've always come back to the reality that Christianity is true. And so what Christ says fits reality. And even if I don't feel the presence of God or if I don't feel guided by the hand of God, in one way that doesn't matter because it is in fact true. And I can look back to times also when I have sensed God's presence in in worship or prayer or fellowship and so on. So uh, we are saved not by feelings, but by the grace of God demonstrated in Christ. And we receive that by faith. And as we grow in Christ, in grace, we see the work of God in our lives. And I saw changes in my life for the better. So there was evidence of conversion within myself. But unlike some of my friends, uh, nothing extraordinary happened at the moment of my conversion or afterwards. But uh, we don't live the Christian life by one experience after the other. We want to submit ourselves to Christ and follow the truth, come what may. So you just mentioned that it wasn't like you had this specifically happy time when you first became a Christian. So How did you grow as a Christian and how did you mature in your faith? You know, a lot of times people would be discouraged and maybe not pursue growing in Christ. Right. Well, a key thing was my involvement in a a very biblically oriented church called First Baptist Church in Eugene, Oregon. And for the first two years I was there, 76 to 78, I sat under the preaching of Dr. Jack MacArthur, who was a tremendous Bible expositor. And I also got involved in the college youth group, which was led by a a marvelous youth minister named Mike Hilty. I developed a lot of good Christian friendships and got very involved in the church, continued to 
study apologetics um, on my own, particularly Francis Schaeffer, C.S. Lewis, Jim Sire, uh, so many others, Os Guinness. So I, as a college student, developed what I could call a parallel curriculum. I had the books and the studies I needed to be involved with as a student, but then as a thinking Christian, I had to read extra. And I gladly did that. So I read my Francis Schaeffer and James Sire and Os Guinness and C.S. Lewis and tried to develop a Christian perspective and a solid apologetic that would meet the challenges I faced at a secular university. And all my degrees are from secular schools. I don't have a theological degree. I teach at a theological seminary, which is a bit odd, I guess. But I've been very motivated to study and think through the Christian message. And let me go back to something that happened right before I converted in 1976. I was climbing a hill outside of Anchorage, Alaska called Flat Top with a friend of mine named John. And I told him that I was considering becoming a Christian. And he said, Doug, if you become a Christian, you will simply associate with Christians, read Christian books, go to Christian activities, and you won't be a thinker anymore. And as I say in the article, I've spent the last 44 years disproving my friend John's prediction. Because in some ways, I've tried to disprove Christianity all these years, meaning that I've looked into the other worldviews, including the atheism that tempted me through Karl Marx and Friedrich Nietzsche and Sigmund Freud. I went back to the Eastern spirituality that I was enticed with and wrote a number of books on the New Age movement. So I want to be an intellectually responsible thinking Christian. It doesn't mean I've found all the answers or that I never waver or that I'm entirely true to my convictions. But as I often tell my students, I think we should try to outthink the world for Christ because we have answers to the deepest questions of life that satisfy the heart and the mind. So you just mentioned that you went to secular educational institutions, and yet you work at a seminary. And so how did you discern what your calling is professionally? I mean, how did that process work for you to end up where you are now if you were studying at various, you didn't go to a seminary, Mm -hmm. don't have a seminary degree, a theological degree, you went down a different path? Right. Well, it came gradually. I realized that I love to study and I developed my writing skills as, at first, a journalism major and then a philosophy major. And I, right after college, got involved in a campus ministry at the University of Oregon called the McKenzie Study Center. And that gave me the opportunity to teach a course that was accredited, actually, through the University of Oregon. It was quite remarkable. It was a special program that had been set up in the 60s. In this program, if you got a faculty sponsor, you could teach a uh, class for credit through the University of Oregon. Now, you weren't paid, but for five years, I taught a course, a 400-level sociology course called The Twilight of Western Thought. And during that time, I was able to study intensely philosophy, psychology, sociology, theology, so many things, teach on these things. And I realized that I had the gift of teaching, and also I was invited to preach at my church. I think I preached my my first sermon uh, at age 21, and then started preaching more regularly, I guess, in my early 20s, and I realized I had some gifting there as well. And uh, at the uh, encouragement of my first wife, Rebecca Merrill Grotheis, I went and got a PhD in philosophy. And I thought I would probably end up at a small Christian school or perhaps another school. But Denver Seminary back in 1992 was interested in me and they knew of my books, Unmasking the New Age, Confronting the New Age, Revealing the New Age Jesus. They were interested in me and they invited me out. And I remember a very long doctrinal interview. I think it was about two and a half, three hours. And I passed. So They thought I I knew enough about scripture and theology to teach uh, philosophy and apologetics and comparative religion 
at Denver Seminary. But I continue to want to be a presence in secular settings. I would speak as often as I can on secular college campuses. I really enjoy writing for non-Christian readers. So if I can get an article or a review published, or better yet, a book published in a secular setting, uh, then that deeply encourages me. Because we need to take apologetics to the non-Christian, not just talk about apologetics with other Christians. Although that's important too. Well, and as you talk with Christians about apologetics, or at least train them, then they can interact with non-believers about Christianity, which most people who are atheists or agnostics, especially today, it seems that people are quite vocal about it, you know, think that Christians are non-thinking, that we have bought into an idea that is um, oppressive and that the world would be better without Christianity or any religion. So thinking about you know, responding to those people who would say, well, Christians are just non-thinkers. They just are indoctrinated. They don't really think carefully about things. How have you been influenced by various thinkers? And who is that who has influenced you over the years? Mm -hmm. Well, sadly, some Christians have an approach called fideism, which says that there is no evidence for the Christian faith and you simply have to believe and maybe try to live on experiences or blind faith. But that's not actually true to scripture because we're called to have a reason for the hope that is within us and we're called to love God with our heart, soul, strength, and mind. So in my experience early on, it was certainly the writings of Francis Schaeffer. I read his book, The God Who Was There in the fall of 1976. And it gave me intellectual courage because Schaeffer said that Christians have a view of the world that answers the deepest needs. And he showed that by reviewing elements in philosophy and literature and popular culture, cinema, and so on. And I think more than anything, that book gave me a sense of hope and encouragement and really empowerment that I don't have to turn off my mind as a Christian. Because the first I'd say about three months of being a Christian, I simply didn't have a theology of the mind. I didn't know how to think things through from a Christian worldview because I wasn't taught that. But when I began to learn that we should outthink the world for Christ and that some of the greatest minds of all time have been Christians like St. Augustine or Blaise Pascal, Thomas Aquinas, C.S. Lewis, then that really helped shape My sense that my calling was to be a teacher, a preacher, a writer. And as I've gotten older, I've realized also it's very significant that I uh, mentor younger people as well. So as you've kind of developed, like you said, a theology of the mind, how has your mind changed and developed over the years? And kind of in a nutshell, what is a theology of the mind and why should people have one? Why should Christians consider right. that? Why would studying these kinds of things be important? And I say that because, as you know, there is a movement at the you know university level of the last several years to say that pursuits like philosophy are unnecessary, that we should encourage students instead to pursue STEM and engineering, and that... Um, it's really not needed. The liberal arts are not needed and they're not really helpful to people. So how would you counter that and say that your mind has changed and developed and then just kind of give us a theology of the mind? Okay. We need a theology of the mind because when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then if we go back to the creation We are made in the image and likeness of God. You see that in Genesis 1, and it's reaffirmed after the fall and the flood in Genesis 9. And we were put here to develop and cultivate the creation. That takes thought. That takes critical thinking. And then if you go to the Great Commission in Matthew 28, we see that we are to bring the teaching of Jesus to the world and disciple the nations. Well, that requires a lot of knowledge and critical thinking. So faith is not the opposite 
of knowledge or the opposite of reason. Paul tells us we walk by faith, not by sight, but he doesn't say we walk by faith, not by knowledge. Uh, We can have the knowledge of God through Christ and the scriptures, and that can be verified, if you will, or justified through good arguments from history and philosophy and so on. Now, certainly most people are not going to become philosophers, and a philosophy degree is not like you can go out and find a philosophy factory and work there. But a philosophy degree is a good pre-law degree or pre-ministerial degree, certainly. But nevertheless, whether or not people are philosophers in a professional sense, we're called to, as Paul says, take every thought captive to obey Christ and to glorify God in our thinking. So I'm really concerned about the decline of the humanities in general and the emphasis merely on what you could call instrumental knowledge, whether it's uh, engineering or technology, whatever it is, that knowledge is needed, but we have to ask the larger questions about what is the meaning of life? How do we gain knowledge? How do we relate the ultimate reality of the triune God to our disciplines in uh, building computers and designing software and matters of public policy, and so on. And we need Christians in those areas to have a Christian worldview, to think virtuously, and to contribute to the common good by being knowledgeable and discerning Christians. So I have tried to motivate and encourage people to do this now for really over 40 years. And so what are some of the things that you've accomplished during the 40 years that you have been in philosophy? Well, I have been a full-time professor at Denver Seminary since 1993, and I've taken great joy in teaching students, mentoring them. Our graduates minister all over the United States, all over the world. Several of them have gone on to get PhDs in philosophy and are teaching in academic institutions. We have graduates in Albania, ministering in Liberia, Czech Republic, France. That's very heartening to me. And also I've been committed to a project of trying to respond to challenges to Christian faith and develop a Christian perspective on issues through my writing. I started out writing quite a bit about the New Age movement My first book was called Unmasking the New Age, 1986, uh, which is still in print, interestingly. And that has been my best-selling book, which is odd because I was only 29 when it came out and I did not have a graduate degree, but seemed to be the right book at the right time. And God bless that. So I've dealt with issues like new religious movements, philosophy of technology, postmodernism, written quite a bit about Blaise Pascal and I guess my perhaps most significant writing achievement is my big book called Christian Apologetics, A Comprehensive Case for Biblical Faith, which came out in 2011. And right now I am working on a second edition of that book. And one thing I realized is that the book did not say enough about the atoning work of Jesus. I certainly mentioned it and I spent several pages on the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and who reconciles us to God through his death, but not enough. So I have been working on a long chapter called Defending the Atonement uh, for the better part of this year. And I will also have a chapter called In Defense of a Church, because if you're going to defend Christianity, you need to defend the institution that Christ founded. He said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And in an age where people say, I'm spiritual but not religious, and an age when people are often suspicious of organized religion, we need a very strong defense of the institution of the church. So I'm trying to bring that together as well. And as I mentioned earlier, I really thrive speaking in settings where there are a lot of non-Christians, particularly university campuses or radio programs or writing articles for 
secular newspapers or magazines, interacting with non-Christians, and so on. So I want to build up the church and reach the world with the knowledge of God as best I can. Earlier in the podcast, you mentioned your late wife, and as I know, it was exactly about two years ago at this time that she passed away. So what was the contribution she made to your ministry? I know you guys were married for more than 30 years. Right. Well, it was tremendous, as I say in the article, without her, no me. She challenged me to go to graduate school, and she inspired me to write my first book. She said that she would help me edit it as I went along. And in fact, she edited all my books through Christian apologetics. But after that, she was too ill to do any more editing. She was a writer and editor herself, also a poet, had a beautiful singing voice. So when I look back at my Christian ministry, Rebecca Merrill Grotheist was an indispensable aspect of that. And if you go look at my books over the years, you'll see that several of them are dedicated to her. In fact, let me just take down Christian apologetics from my shelf for a minute and read my dedication to Rebecca Merrill Grotheis, astute and intrepid editor, dedicated follower of Jesus Christ, beloved wife. And it was just about two years ago that she left her troubled body and went to the arms of her Savior. You also mentioned earlier that it's important to you to be mentoring people who are younger than you, who are coming along. And so how do you incorporate mentoring younger Christians as a Christian philosopher and as an apologist? At Denver Seminary, we have a very well thought out and developed mentoring program. So some of my students will choose me as their faculty mentor, but that's not the only way that I mentor. I try to get a sense of the students that could be encouraged by my friendship. So I seek them out and spend time with them, pray for them, try to see what their gifts might be. I try to find opportunities for them to minister. And a lot of it is simply getting to know people and being a spiritual friend to people. Now in the age of COVID, it's more difficult. So just recently I had a Skype conversation with one of my students that I've been mentoring not Skype, Zoom, and I'll be having some other sessions as well. And that's one of the hard things about this time we're living in is that it's more difficult to interact with people one-on-one, but I'm certainly committed to trying to be a godly influence in younger people's lives, not just younger people, but especially people who could benefit from my teaching and my experience. So you've Mentioned that you've been a Christian for many decades, for a long time. So how do you envision the future? What does the future of your ministry look like? Well, God only knows, but I hope that I can capitalize on my knowledge and my experience to continue to teach and preach and write and mentor to the glory of God. As I mentioned, I'm working hard on a second edition of Christian Apologetics. And if any of my books outlive me, it would probably be that one. I'm looking for opportunities to engage in apologetics wherever I can and write as much as I can on a variety of subjects. Uh, Christian Research Institute has published uh, one of my articles on the pandemic and My first article with the Christian Research Institute was back in 1986, so it's been a long and fruitful relationship, and I've been very grateful to this ministry, uh, first under the leadership of Walter Martin and Hank Hanegraaff and all the wonderful opportunities with Elliot Miller as editor for so many years, who's gone on to be with the Lord a few years ago. So I really want to do the same kinds of things, except I hope with greater integrity and greater effectiveness, Lord willing. Well, finally, I want to end with some fun rapid-fire questions for Doug. So, Doug, what did you have for breakfast today? Coffee. What are you doing for vacation this summer? Well, I'm in rural Alaska, so we are hiking and uh, taking our trailer to various places and seeing the beautiful outdoors. 
And what's something that's on your bucket list? Oh, goodness, on my bucket list. Um, I don't have a big bucket list, but my wife and I would love to visit northern Italy at some point. Uh, my relatives on my mom's side are from Italy, and the last time I was there was in the 1970s, so we would love to go to Florence, um, Rome, and so on. Well, thanks, Doug, for being a guest on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest has been Dr. Doug Grotheis, who has written an online exclusive feature article for the Christian Research Journal. It's an in-depth article completely free at our website, equip.org, where you can read it there. And thank you for listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast. We'd like to hear from you, so connect with us on social media, like the Bible Answer Man Facebook page, and follow CRI, Christian Research Journal, Hank Hanegraaff, and the Bible Answer Man on Twitter. And please subscribe to the Bible Answer Man channel on YouTube. If you like this episode, please subscribe to the Postmodern Realities Podcast on iTunes, and please rate and review our podcast. When you rate and review our podcast, it helps others see our content. And please share this episode on your social media accounts. Be sure you tune in daily to the Bible Answer Man broadcast hosted by CRI President Hank Hanegraaff, who answers your questions live on air. To ask Hank a question, call 888-ASK-HANK, Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. In addition, head to iTunes and subscribe to Hank Unplugged, Hank's audio podcast, Follow Hank off the grid, where he has in-depth conversations with some of the brightest minds discussing topics you care about. So until our next Christian Research Journal author conversation, thanks for listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast.